your skull is in your stomach? <laughs> yes. Doctors are supposed to put it, the skull inside the stomach just to make sure that um, this, it's not, it doesn't die. Are they going to put it back one day? Uh, not anymore. It was supposed to do it. Uh, they're supposed to do it like three months with after the stroke, but then it's been three years. <laughs> but um, my parents and I, I decided not to make, put put uh, anything for it, I guess. But I just want to make sure that I don't hit my head or, or, I, or, I, or else I die. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 105, and my guest today is Leanne Carla Bugornia. Leanne is an AVM stroke survivor, and when I came across her Instagram bio, it wrote, my stroke was the greatest thing that happened to me. This is something that about three years after the first bleed in my own brain due to a ruptured AVM, I was able to say, and I could say this despite the fact that I had deficits and my future health and well being was somewhat uncertain. Some time ago, I put out a call on Instagram to ask people that felt the same way to connect so that I could interview them and find out if there was any similarities in how they got to be able to say that stroke was the best thing that ever happened to them. Early interviews of the people that related to that statement and agreed to be interviewed revealed that there were similarities in how stroke survivors were able to get to that place where they could say that stroke was the best thing that happened to them and a pattern began to emerge. The participants demonstrated a growth mindset, had an upgrade of emotional intelligence, improved their nutrition, began connecting to their internal voice and found ways to exercise more, create better sleep habits, connected with their community and found the purpose for their existence amongst other things. What I've learned from these interviews is that there is a way that we can move people from stroke being the worst thing that has ever happened to them to potentially being the best thing that has happened to them. And all they need to know is how. If you want to know how, just get in touch. Send me a DM on Instagram or Facebook or just email bill at recoveryafterstroke.com. Now, if you just found this podcast, you might not know that you can also download a full transcript of every episode, including this episode from recoveryafterstroke.com. It's perfect if you like to take notes, highlight sections of the discussion that you found interesting or just prefer to read rather than listen. Simply go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes, scroll to find the name of the episode you just listened to, click on the link, scroll down until you see the orange download button, which says transcript, click the download transcript button, enter your email address and your download will begin. Also, when you get to the end of this episode, whether you are watching on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcast app, please do me a favor and share this episode in other groups you hang out in. This will help someone that is doing it tough at the moment perhaps feel a little better about the journey that they are currently on. Also, if you like this podcast and you think it makes a massive difference to you and the stroke community, please do me a favor and leave a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts from. And now it's on with the show. Leanne Bigornia, welcome to the podcast. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for being on the podcast all the way from the Philippines. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you for this opportunity. To You're my finally very share my story. Guest. Yeah, yeah. You're my very first guest from the Philippines. So um, I'm really oh, wow. excited to meet somebody from a different part of the world. <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. Thank you. This is awesome. <laughs> hey, Leanne, before sure. we get started, can you just tell me a little bit about what happened to you? Um, well, before my stroke, I've always been like super fat. <laughs> I would just eat whatever I wanted. And uh, I didn't really take care of myself. And I also worked as a call center um, agent. So I, I would work at night 
um, nine shift, nine p.m. to six in the morning, and uh, I've been doing it for like more than three, four years, I guess. Um, I didn't know that I shouldn't be working like that because I had high high blood sugar and high sugar. I mean, high blood pressure, high sugar, and I didn't really drink my medications as often as you should doing uh and then um i noticed that i would always have it i, I like i always had like a lot of headaches like cigarette like maybe every day but then i didn't really think a lot about it but i just i just thought it just like maybe because i didn't sleep well or you know something like that and then one day um i was oh, i was with my with my friends and uh, um we were to we went to a um, mall and we bought some phones and and after that i was supposed to go home cuz um i was going to go home but then i noticed that we had uh, we had to re- renovate our home so i couldn't sleep there so i went to my friend and um because i had a new phone i i always um check on the settings like you know just check everything's fine uh so i didn't really sleep well and then i noticed that my head had i had a crazy headache like it's not the normal headache that i usually had so, and then i told my friend um that i th- i think it's something wrong or like there's something wrong and um the crazy thing was that i couldn't see from my right side and i couldn't see anything and then i wanted to vomit like i vomited twice and then finally uh i told him to call um an ambulance uh and tell them that it's my to call them my dad to call my dad um since my dad is um uh, um an a doctor and he also is a it's because of he is part of emergency rescue unit foundation so they know us like our family um so they immediately know that it's different or like if i say that it's call for my dad then it's immediate so they called and i think he they answered like the first the first they didn't answer my dad didn't answer them the first time but then the second my dad called i mean my dad answered so they said um dr bigorania uh, your daughter uh there's something wrong we're, we're going to go to the emergency room um which hospital do you want to go so they we we found they found me in the emergency room and um my cousins my brother and my dad was there but i don't really know <laughs> what ha- what was going on because um I was going in and out of of it <laughs> and um consciousness yeah I, yeah consciousness thank you <laughs> and after that um we had yeah imagine I think my my mom and everyone ex- except my dad was in Cebu everyone else was outside of the country or the oh no outside of the city or yeah so they immediately arrived and they were told my dad was told that my blood um my blood pressure hit i think 250 wow. and yeah and then um the doctor said that he hasn't like he have he like all the patients that he had 250 bp uh, for the blood pressure would would die like 
they already told him that just let you know that all of my bed ca- um, all my med all of my patients are in a bad position and just but um we'll do whatever and then my actually my dad asked for a priest a priest first before the OR um good thing it's a good thing that uh there was a one one room for an OR that was um safe or like it was you know, they they could do it so yeah i'm sorry and then yeah i think after that um they didn't i did, they just thought that i would be on a coma like longer than i should have been I think I just in a I was in a coma for like four or six hours, I think, and then when I woke up, I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, my sister was joking, and then she just said, "Carla, you've been asleep for two years," and then I cried. <laughs> I cried because <laughs> two years, and then I had a boyfriend then, and then. She she woke up. I, she she was crying. I, I mean, laughing. And she said, "No, no, no. I was just kidding. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you don't have hair anymore because we had to remove it. So I didn't have hair here in the in in the back, except for the front part. So I cried even more because my hair. I had the." My hair, I think my long, my my hair was so long. <laughs> that was my like that was the best part I had. That my part, the best part of my body <laughs> was my hair. <laughs> and so, my, when my sister said, "I don't ever have," I like I didn't have hair anymore. I cried even more. <laughs> and then, <laughs> um, so I try. I didn't understand what was going on. I just. Noticed that people were visiting, and I didn't really know. I was in a hospital. Mm. I I just kept t- telling people, I mean, hey, you want to eat? You know, um, what are you doing here? Then he said, we're here for you. You know, we're here because, um, do you know what's going on, Carla? I didn't even know my parents know my parents' names, my sisters' names. I didn't know anyone. Wow. <laughs> um, except for I think I had one friend. A few friends who like I always know their names, but but the rest no. So they cried, <laughs> and um, I also cried. But I'm not really. I just I was just worried, what yeah. was going on. Yeah. So yeah. how old were you at the time? Thirty. Thirty. Mm-hmm. I was thirty that day. That time, yeah. Was, yeah. And how long? It was November. That was in November twenty two. 2016. So 2016. four years, well, yeah, almost four. Years. Yeah, four so years when, I think. <laughs> when you finally realized, when you finally got out of hospital, what mm-hmm. did you need to relearn how to do again? You must have had some um, challenges. Yeah, um, I was in the hospital for three weeks, and then after that, I was good thing i was able to have christmas enjoy the christmas uh, for um have christmas with my family and friends and um after that my my i i immediately had speech therapy from the hospital until like until now or until a few months after mm-hmm. um so i had speech therapy and i was told why I needed had spe- I needed to have speech therapy, so I had to go back ABCs. I had to learn the ABCs again, numbers, everything, <laughs> names yeah. of people. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, I think that. And um, did you uh, need to learn how to walk again, or was there any challenge? No, you walking. I had. I had. While I was in the hospital, I had um, physical therapy. Mm-hmm. While there, um, I had they they let me walk first um, slowly, but then they they asked, "Can you still do it?" I said, "Yeah, I 
I can do it. Um, so that I think it, I did, I did it twice, twice, once, and then the second time was outside already the hospital, and the, after that I no longer needed speech. I mean, um, physical mm -hmm. therapy. Okay. Yeah. So what I needed was um, just um, speech therapy. Did you need to learn how to speak in English and Filipino? Um, actually, I am my my first language is English, and everything that I I spoke while in the hospital was all English. So um, everyone, I didn't understand a lot. I didn't really understand what they were saying except for English. So. Um, my friends would like text or like send me messages during while I was in the hospital. I didn't understand what was going on or like what they were saying in my messages. I just put the heart, like, the, the, <laughs> I just like the icon heart. And then, so yeah, um, they just, I, did, I didn't know what was going on, but just, yeah, I just kept saying the heart or like putting the heart. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I understand. So when you went home, what was your memory mm -hmm. like? Did you have some memory problems? Any other issues uh, apart from speech? I actually didn't know that I was, or I didn't know that I couldn't sleep. Oh. Yeah. Um, I noticed that, I noticed that one morning I could see, like, well, I was, like, when I, when I woke up, I could see things or places and people. And I, I was in a beach, I think, in that dream. And then I said, that was so weird. I could see things. Then, so I Googled. Like Google was my best friend mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole time. So I Googled. And then I Googled um, stroke patients see, see things. I was like, hey, see things. So I think... Maybe I think it it went through, um, and then I yeah it went through like something's going wrong, uh, like a physical, or no, not not physical, but yeah, I just like googled, uh, for speech, I mean for, um, stroke patients see see things, and then Google I uh, I went down 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 and just checked until I saw the word dream. And then I realized, oh, I was dreaming. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and after that, I would always write the of, I would write, if I dreamt, I would write it down, uh, what I dreamt, and what day, what time, and uh, how I felt, you know, everything, like a, like a scientist. <laughs> just to make sure like I had everything like even about my speech yeah. um things that or feelings that I would need to write down yeah I would all write them down so what's the biggest challenge that you have now with regards to the aftermath of the stroke um now not really not I now I'm okay. I'm although <laughs> if I'm talking like I'm talking to you right now, and um, I'm excited, so I'm blah 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 blah. <laughs> it's not. I should like calm down and talk to you properly. <laughs> so that's that's my problem. But I don't really think of it think of it as a problem. Um, and also I. From my head as a nurse, <laughs> from my head to my to my toes, I wrote everything. Like number one, my head, um, my skull is still here. Actually, uh, it's still soft. My parents decided to keep it soft, um, and my my skull in my stomach, um, because just to make sure that if I like, if I have another stroke. The pressure, the pressure is not that um, high, or yeah. So, so that's moment, okay. You're missing it's, part of your skull. Yep. Yeah. And where is it? 
It's here in my, in my stomach. If you've had a stroke and are in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously because you've never had a stroke before, you probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Your skull is in your stomach? <laughs> yes. Doctors are supposed to put it, the skull inside the stomach just to make sure that um, this, it's not, it doesn't die. You know, it still kills, right? So, yeah. Alive. But, yeah. Are they going to put it back one day? Uh, not anymore. It was supposed to do it, uh, they're supposed to do it like three months with after the stroke, but then it's been three years. <laughs> but um, my parents and I, I decided not to make, put put uh, anything for it, I guess. But I just want to make sure that I don't hit my head or, 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 or else I die. But it's fine. I've, went to, I've gone to concerts with my friends and I don't need to wear a he he helmet, but... <laughs> but it's fine. I just want to make sure that it's all fine. <laughs> it's cool, actually. And then my friends, especially the guys, I would tell about. I would tell them about it, and then they would always freak out when I try them to. Okay, why don't you try to? You are you sure you're strong? You know, I ask them challenge, and then when they when they try to hold it or touch it, they always freak out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Speaking, it's amazing that <laughs> amazing what the doctors can do these days. That's just amazing. Yeah. And, and that the, the skull, the part of your skull is in your stomach. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. can you feel it in your stomach? <laughs> Not really. At first, yes. Uh, I mean, at first, yes. Um, but uh, it's fine. It's, it's nothing. I don't really feel it anymore. Okay. <laughs> so how big are we talking? And, uh, what size is it? The piece. I think it's like this yeah. small. Yeah. yeah. And then after, uh, aside from the head, uh, my hand, it was my hand uh, that everything else is fine. Like I didn't, I couldn't, I, I didn't have problems with my feet or anything except for my hand. Mm. It was this, it was just like this the whole time in the hospital. And then I was talking to my sister one time, and then I said, Kina, that's her name, Kina, uh, what is this? And then she said, it's your hand. I said, no, this is my hand. I have a hand. She said, then she said, no, Carla, you have another hand. I said, <laughs> so I told you, I, I mentioned, you mentioned, I mean, I mentioned that I had, I bought a new phone, right? Yeah. So I put the phone here, and I said, oh, it's for my phone. Wow. <laughs> I just, I thought it was just like a holder or something. Huh? And then I needed, yeah, um, therapy here for my hand. And, um, so you didn't yeah, realize I, that the hand was attached to your body as a hand. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I didn't know. I just thought it was like an extra thing, you know, that's something. <laughs> I didn't even see, but I could see from, that's the third thing. I couldn't see from this, the right, no, right, yeah, from your right side. And um, I didn't know, notice, or I didn't also know that there was a problem. I just know, I just noticed that there's something wrong with my eye. 
So I asked my sister. So I told her, Gina, how come there's something wrong with my eye? And then she told me um, that this part is like it's a bit blank. So she asked me, "What can you see?" I said, "Well, here, 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 here. I can't see here. So everything here is all black. Then, but now it's colorful. I can see colors. So I can see it if if people like if I someone comes here." I can see that there's something wrong. Like something's here yeah. beside me. Okay, you don't yeah. know what it is, but you can see that there's some something near you. Yes, and um, this it was actually one of my goals. Uh, I've never been to a to a cin- cinema, I watch a movie by myself after the stroke until a few like last year, I think. Um, I, I put it as a, my goal, one of my goals was to finally watch a movie by myself and ha- not be anxious <laughs> because I couldn't see, right? A few years or a few months and then I, I would be anxious because I couldn't be sure, like, I might hit somebody or, you know, <laughs> but after that, uh, I think two years or a year and a half, I was able to go out with my friends all by myself. I didn't have to ask my sister to come out or go out with me. Excellent. Yeah. That's so good to hear. <laughs> right now, your hand is yours. You know that the hand belongs to yep. you. <laughs> yes. You have a little bit of vision. The vision is back. You have some colorful things Colors now. There. So mm-hmm. you know when someone's around, you're able to speak really well. And yes. seems to have settled down a lot. Um, now, you mm-hmm. were a nurse. Yes, I am. Is that what you were doing or were you a nurse? Um, before that, I was a nurse in the emergency, rest, in emergency room. Uh-huh. Uh, that was like three or four years ago or five, four, four years ago, I think. Yeah. And then I worked, oh, five years. And then I worked um, as a call center again. Uh-huh. Um yeah. <laughs> okay, so you weren't working as a nurse at the time. Um, mm-hmm. But as a nurse, you know how mm-hmm. important it was to look after your blood pressure. Yes, I know. <laughs> which is crazy, right? It's, oh, this, which is so bad. I know it's bad. But, yeah. that you know, like when people say that the, the hardest patient is yourself (laughs) so yeah that's what happened (laughs) and i would always go out with my friends drink smoke because of the page of the the stress for work yeah Yeah. and but it's i know it's bad but and i've changed everything i no longer smoke and drink so (laughs) okay so you used to smoke as well okay so you had all this, all the risk factors for a mm-hmm. hemorrhagic stroke as a result of high blood pressure. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, but um, my stroke, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Your stroke? Uh, my stroke is actually um, for, because of AV, val, uh, AV malformation. Ah. I was born with it. Um, right. It's already in my head, yeah. yeah um, as a kid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there seems to be a lot of people who have had an AVM on this podcast. Yes. Stroke. I had oh, really? A, yeah. I had an AVM. I didn't have high blood pressure. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I had an AVM that burst, and I used to smoke and drink and work too much and do all those things. So you sound yeah. very similar in the way that you used to live your life. Did you think mm-hmm. you were, uh, it's not going to happen to me? Yes. Yes. Definitely. I did not imagine that that would happen i was just like uh, but actually you know what um i don't know have you tried like you just think that there's something wrong with my world i just want to change new i just i want to renew something Mm -hmm. because at that time i was actually praying (laughs) because um that 
time when I was in the hospital, um, before my hospital, about before the stroke, yes, I was wondering what what my purpose is and um, what's going on. Why it? Because I was supposed to work again as a work as a nurse, but in a call center, and in that way I could um, work at the same uh, in the same company, but then go to America. That was my goal. But then I had the stroke. So, yeah. Um, I, I, but at first, I did not think of it as something that's good. Yeah. I was wondering what was going on. I, while I was in the hospital, while my sister was sleeping, I cried because I realized I no longer have a job. I'm going to resign or I I would n- never be the same Carla mm. and uh my boyfriend at that time left me while I was in the hospital so everything was crazy oh, for really yeah really really yeah, difficult but, yeah but then but before that I was because I was super fat and I was always depressed I was mad at everybody um and I would just I would be my friends or I would be with my friends or my families, but I, I wasn't really there. Yeah. You you, were yeah. Yeah. I was always looking for something else, something new, something I want to re I wanted to renew everything or reset everything. Yeah. And then when the stroke happened and then I, I spoke to, I had my speech therapist, um, my the craziest thing or the the miracle that he told me was Carla there's only things two things they have to do to renew or re um recover I said okay what's that he said two things sing and dance he said and I was like are you sure because sing and dance are my favorite things I'm supposed I was supposed to take theater theater arts but then I was a stroke. I mean, uh, I was a nurse. But I realized it was a, mir- mir- a miracle because the way that God made it, like made me re- re- recover was through singing and dancing, things that I love. So yeah, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. <laughs> wow. So you, you do sound like me. I was 37, right? And mm-hmm. I was working too many hours i wasn't happy i was always angry and yelling at everybody in my friends. What say? <laughs> i was um always wanting something different and something new to happen i wanted to make massive changes i didn't understand exactly how to make those changes i didn't have exactly. the, the people around me that i could ask questions or get advice from i didn't know who they were mm-hmm. how to bring them to me um, mm-hmm. yes and I was always stuck in this loop of going and doing things that I didn't enjoy. I didn't know mm-hmm. what my purpose was. I was just working to make money, to pay the bills, exactly. to pay everybody else. And yeah. I, I had no fun, no joy in my life. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly how I felt. And then I had a stroke. And that's why that's the best thing that ever happened. And like, I realized to, like when I was in the hospital, right? And while I was crying. I cried, cried, I cried, 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 and I really cried. And then I, I told myself, Carla, tomorrow renew and change everything. So I did. I changed everything. Um, I, I when I come home, when I came home, um, I would exercise, and then I, I would eat the, the, the diet that the hospitals or the doctors told me to take but then um after a few months i was wondering why i still didn't gain i mean lose the the gain the the weight so i checked um google no i checked youtube my other best friend and i found keto uh, and intermittent fasting i saw dr eric berg so i did keto and intermittent fasting i lost 
82 pounds. But then I also gained it because, but, but it's because I had depression and um, because I would eat my emotions away. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I gained again, but then I realized that I, I, I don't want to go back to that. And uh, yeah, now I'm going back to the beginning and back on keto. And I also had um, uh, an out-of-body out experience. Were you, or did you try that? Um, yeah. Okay, so before we go there, let me just say mm -hmm. that 82 yes. pounds is 37 kilograms for people who are living yes. from another country. That is half my body weight at the moment. That is a massive amount. So congratulations on that. Now, I understand why you went back and put on weight because mm -hmm. at the beginning, you're mm -hmm. making a decision about your health and well-being yeah. and, and you're sticking to that and you're going to get yourself better, but you're not dealing with emotional challenges Emotions. that you've dealt, yeah. that you haven't dealt with from a long time ago. And mm -hmm. a lot of people use food to feel better at that moment when they're mm -hmm bad and exactly depression, depression is very common in stroke survivors because mm -hmm. i think the statistic is something like 33 percent or more of people who experience mm -hmm. stroke will experience depression yes so that's that very common. true and one way that people use food is to overcome those negative feelings at that time mm -hmm. so yes. that makes sense why you went there but the great thing was now you had this tool of how I already lost weight once, now you mm -hmm. know you can do it when you deal with your emotional problems and mm -hmm. overcome them and let them free and, and release them, then you can go back to this yes. keto or this intermittent fasting diet which worked for you. Exactly. So, and um, really I'm sorry. Amazing. Oh, <laughs> actually, there's something else. Um, I, I don't know if you if you felt it or if you tried, but I it's just now the past month I think that I realized that before before now before yeah a, yeah a month ago um it's like I wasn't in my body uh it's like I lost the weight right I lost the weight. But I was always saying, oh, how come there's something wrong? It's like I'm not in a new... I, I, I thought it was in my new self. But then I wasn't really me, like the real Carla, mm -hmm. until the last uh, this month. And then I realized, I felt weird. And I was like wondering... And I checked on... I looked, uh, I looked at the things, my pictures, my videos and things that really make me happy and then everything that mixed and then that just felt that came together mixed. yeah got together yeah went together like or something yeah so was um, it like, an external thing that happened or did you feel that on an internal of your body both can you say wow. it's actually both that was so weird it's like one day i was like okay it's carla you know, the so you felt <laughs> your so identity. Weird. Did you? It was it your identity suddenly became apparent. Mm -hmm. Me, yes. Like before time, I was in the hospital. I just like no, oh, like I kept when I lost the weight. Like some, I just thought this. Oh, it's a rate. It's a new Carla. But then, where is Carla? Where am I? Like where have I been? And then I was. I looked. I. I looked at my pictures, I looked at my friends, and then it's just it's just so weird. It's like it's not me until this month actually. And then that's why I wanted to make sure that um I talk to you about it. <laughs> because it I'm not sure if it's not just if it's just me or like if there are other people who who feel the same way. So yeah. <laughs> wow, that is um it is, there are other people who feel the same way, especially the mm -hmm. things that you've spoken about. Mm -hmm. Often when I speak to people who say that stroke was the best thing that happened to them, 
They say mm -hmm. almost exactly what you said. They talk about it wasn't the best thing at the beginning. Then mm -hmm. they talk about there was some kind of purpose that needed to happen. Yeah. They needed to find. Then they then they talk about God or some kind of external yes. venue or external force, um, the universe, God, the universe, something mm -hmm. like that. They also talk about um, having changing their exercise and mm -hmm. their food. They also talk about dealing with the emotional intelligence, and they also talk mm -hmm. about this identity change that happens. They they change from being somebody who is not their best self to they change mm -hmm. to who is their best self and all mm -hmm. the pieces of the puzzles come together yes. and they start to see themselves as somebody who has had a great experience and mm -hmm. difficult at the time and it caused a lot of problems and some of them can't walk yet or can't move mm -hmm. one of their arms and some of them have memory problems or speech problems but they still mm -hmm think that stroke is the best thing that ever happened best. for me it took about four years as well mm -hmm. oh oh yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned that you had it long yeah. yeah so i i said that one day so cool yeah to somebody and i didn't know <laughs> i didn't know why i said it or how i came to say it and then mm -hmm. i got really curious am i the only one saying this am i crazy enough to be the only person to say this there must <laughs> be other people and of course when I asked other people on Instagram, many mm -hmm. people said the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so cool, right? It's like, I don't know. It's so awesome. But like, and now I'm just, what I'm, uh, I just want to make sure that like, everything is balanced, like physically, spiritually, mental, mental, men, yeah, mentally. And, um, yeah, spiritual, mental, physical, and um, yeah, that's four things. Yeah. So tell me, Carla, how did you deal with the emotional challenges? So did you do some kind of therapy? What was it that helped you overcome those problems? I think it was just a, um, a few years ago, I was able to go to um uh, a a psych a psychologist or psych yeah a psychologist um so but so i think this i did the same thing that she told me do before told me to do before um write your emotions <laughs> write 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 and i think that's what i did i would write and i would i just added Aside from um, writing, I would also sing and dance. So I think I just did that. But yeah, <laughs> I think so that's what I did. To, so you started to do a journal about mm -hmm. what you were feeling. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when you put that in the journal, what did it do to those emotions? Because if you're feeling sad or anxious or depressed, putting it in writing, what did that do for you? It, it's like for me it's like it's like a it's my way of saying goodbye to it i think wow like i write the words and then i would for, for example i would like dear blah 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 and then i write something like a, like a letter for like myself like let's say it's for myself like five years I'll go and I write, dear Kyla, do you remember when you, you know? And then after that, I would cry <laughs> and then let it go. That's it. <laughs> I think that's what I did. Mostly, yeah. That's, that, that's I don't really. That sounds really cool. So when I coach somebody who's going through emotional challenges, Mm -hmm. if I try to encourage them to go to where the problem started. So mm -hmm. some people will talk about, um, you know, um, I, I was in a relationship, the relationship broke up, I felt really yes. sad. And then since then, I haven't been able to have a new relationship again. Yes. 
And usually it's because then they've not dealt with the relationship issue in, from the past. Yes. And going back to the past and checking in with those feelings and emotions and dealing with them there makes mm-hmm. it go away, like you said. Now, it doesn't mean that the, the breakup didn't happen. It doesn't mean that mm-hmm. the emotion wasn't difficult. It just means that it's not anymore there and therefore... Yes. They had an experience, they dealt with it, and now it's not affecting them in the future. Yes, exactly. It, it sounds like you did that on your own, but was that a tip that you got from your counsellor, your psychologist? Yes. Um, he, she told me before, she told, she told me to just write your emotions. Yeah. Um, anything, and always put on the, the date and the time and why you're writing this um so i think that helped um and also my friends and my family of course but um sometimes i would because i don't really share my feelings (laughs) so um i would just keep it to myself until it's it just it's just too much for me so that's when i would like just sing and dance or like listen to rock <laughs> so and then i would feel better <laughs> yeah tell me how is it how important is it to have purpose and what does that mean for you to have purpose uh that's awesome but uh actually i didn't really have a purpose i didn't know what my purpose was before um like you like you said i would just i would just work for the money until the stroke and then um i kept asking or I, myself what's what is my purpose and um uh i think i it's just this year or a few months that i realized that this my purpose i think my purpose is to share my story especially on stroke aphasia um on keto and intermittent fasting like a mix of everything and depression and you know what you've been through (laughs) um but to just share your story anyway i'm because I'm always, I'm such a talkative person. (laughs) So I think that's my way of like, that my my purpose is to share Um, because not all the stroke, not all the stroke patients um, are in depression. But like you said, there are people who, who see things or see stroke as the greatest or the best thing so yeah. yeah yeah i understand the people who don't see it yet yes stroke is not an easy thing to deal with and for a lot of people it causes a lot of problems um yeah. so you have this new purpose you're focusing on food and you're exercising differently you've had um you've had this emotional release where you've released a whole bunch of emotional mm-hmm. problems that you've held on to and you found your identity. So describe your identity now. So who are you now? And who, how is that different from who you were before? before? Like, who are you now? Um, actually, I also checked uh, with, with your question. Um, I also wrote who, who is Carla? You know, like, um what in core within my core like who am i with no the money without the money without the the um as a nurse i am not a nurse like everything's dead no money no nothing like so who am i and like um like i i am someone who has like you know my culture and then my family, um, everything that my grandparents, my parents, my cousins, my my friends, um, who like who they know me, is like, 
and that's in, that's Carla in my core. But then to add that, my what things I love, like um, like let's say my core, right? Um, um, my culture as a Filipina, um, and then like traditions, family traditions, and uh, um, like what makes me happy. And then, like, like love, of course, faith, hope, and love. Um, and and then after that, but but outside that, like the things that I am into, like, um, star stargazing, puzzles, um, documentaries, uh, puzzles. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that. Um, road uh, road trips and. Uh, poetry you know like I just I wrote everything about that and then yeah and then I would see that oh so this is Carla this is who I am like whatever happens um because before I would always I would be depressed aside from that, that I would also be anxious like what if someone thinks that I'm there's something wrong with me like I can't see because, you know, because of the stroke. But then because they can't see that I had a stroke, they can't, uh, they wouldn't really understand why I can't see. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would have to explain again and again. And then, or like I have a stroke. So people would say, are you sure you don't look like you had a stroke? It's like, uh, okay. So I would explain again what happened. And then I realized that my stroke, I don't see it as a bad thing. My stroke, I'm like a super Superman. <laughs> I'm like Superman now. Like for super me, it's a super additional, way. yeah, <laughs> super woman. Yeah, like a super. It's something. Some something that's additional instead of a minus. Yeah, yeah no, I see what you're saying. So you who you are didn't really change it never Mm. really changed you just reminded yourself reminded myself yes and before you weren't being that person you knew who you were but you were being somebody else to make money to have a job to do all these other things and you forgot who you were yes and now the show mm -hmm. helped you remind yourself of that yes but before i would always i didn't i always wanted to make sure that everyone liked me mm. um um but i like like i would always be I, I was always worried like people might not like me or like you know things like that but then with the stroke now i would i don't really i don't really it's bad but i'm like like i don't care not bad i'm i yeah i am okay i am fine i am patient i mean i am in peace with who i am <laughs> whatever happens like if someone says something bad or something's like what you had a stroke you know like you mean like they see stroke as something bad mm. and i would i would always say no actually my stroke's the best thing then they would wondering why yeah. so i would explain that's <laughs> so, interesting. Yeah. you know when did you notice that? Like, what happened? One day, stroke wasn't the best thing, and then one day, it was. Right? How did you notice that? I, I think when I, when I was thinking about, I, when I, I wrote everything, right? My, the story. And then I realized that the way that got, because I wrote how it started, right? The stroke. Um, and then I saw uh, like who I was, and then what happened to the stroke, or uh, like what happened because of the stroke. And then I also real um, I realized that the part that um, the miracle was um, that the stroke happened, you know, the way that God let it happen. <laughs> I, that's when I wrote, I realized, like, oh, so I was always sad, right? 
and I was mad at everyone before the stroke and then I was looking for a way to reset and then I realized when I had a stroke and then I I saw that only two things that I needed to re- recover was singing and dancing and then I was like oh so this is God God's way of saying Carla you wanted a reset here it is <laughs> Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll ask you a question. It's not something that happened, but mm-hmm. what if you weren't able to get back to singing properly? If your voice wasn't perfect or dancing properly, what would that mean? Um, actually, when I was in the hospital then, um, and then my speech therapist and my sister said, Carla, okay, sing, sing the song. What's your favorite song? And then I realized I couldn't sing it. I I couldn't remember the lyrics and then I I was so sad because I didn't know how to do it <laughs> and then yeah I, I was so sad at that time and then I said this is I have to do it I have to change it and so every time I would I would um try to sing a song i would try to remember some anything about the lyrics but since i've i've always loved learning about the lyrics or the why why the song is um i would yeah after that i would write the the lyrics and then sing um i think that's the thing that made me stronger but if if i didn't sing and dance I, I don't know I think I'd be super super depressed and worried yeah because like right now I'm talking to you I just realized oh my gosh yeah so that's I, bothering you yeah. that's bothering you that maybe if you didn't get back to doing that yeah it wouldn't have been the best but do you think there's another way you can still do singing and dancing even if it's not like before is there any other way that you can still have a singer's identity and a dancer's identity if you couldn't actually walk or if you couldn't actually make a beautiful sound with your voice can you still be a singer if you can't make a beautiful sound with your voice Hmm. Mm, let's say if i couldn't know how i didn't know the lyrics i was still i can still hum although it's not so nice <laughs> but i like let's say something with my throat like i can't sing it or like um yeah sing anymore um i can sing listen i can listen to to the songs i guess yeah so anything with music i think is the best thing that you need yeah music <laughs> yeah fair enough well, i understand that it would be difficult if you couldn't sing and dance it would be even yeah. more but I've also yeah. come across a lot of stroke survivors who aren't walking yet and mm-hmm. because one of their legs is not um, able to help them walk at the moment. Mm-hmm. But they're still participating even in their wheelchair in yeah. type of events that are similar to dancing or, or, mm-hmm. or being on stage and they're still acting and they're still in theatre. And even if mm-hmm. they didn't get their, their, their old voice back, they're still able to sing even if the voice doesn't sound the same and the singing process and Mm -hmm. maybe they're not singing to create a a brand new album or brand new record or whatever, but they're still able to have the experience of singing. Yes. So it didn't didn't go away completely. It's just different than what it was before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. What a fascinating, fascinating story of recovery and stroke (laughs) and, um, and then this shift from stroke being the worst thing that happened to you to the best thing that Mm-mm. happened to you. What do you hope to do in the next few years ahead? What do you hope to achieve in the next few years ahead? <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> I have so many goals. I spoke uh, about the like, stroke and uh, intermittent fasting and keto um, and aphasia. Um, I, aside from finishing my book, 
I want to also do a podcast like yours. Yep. And <laughs> I also want to, um, I actually wanted to, I already told my friends that we ha- already have it planned, but because of this lockdown, um, we can't do anything, but just planning. Um, I actually, we're having to have, we're planning to have um, a big, like a stroke, uh, like a stroke, like a three day stroke fest or something like that. Yep. Like where you, like all the people who are sharing their diet, like keto and intermittent fasting, low carb, um, low sugar, and, um, you know, things like that. And then other side, beside that would be like gyms, like people from the gyms, like we'd have this um, race, like one, per, like like five people from the race who are from the gym and then one stroke patient. So they would, it would be like a mix of brain and physical or brain and body. Um, <laughs> body yeah. And um, the body with them, of course, with them and then the brain. Because I noticed that patients would, who were stro- who had a stroke would always think that they would no longer be useless. Mm. That's how I felt. And then uh, you would also think that the family just, you know, some families would always just put that patient, just put her beside or just in their room, mm. given just food, and that's it. You don't, They don't really take care of her or yeah. him. Yeah. So that's what I want to do. It's like a one one weekend where where spa, um, muscle, uh, massage and therapy or whatever, and all the patients and also the speech therapies, uh, uh, speech therapists and I'm sorry, <laughs> speech therapists and um, physical therapists and everywhere in one place. And all there for the stroke and and yeah. aphasia. Yeah. Lovely. So, did you also experience aphasia? Yes, I had. Yeah, I had to start the ABCs. I had to learn ABCs and yeah. read and write. Yeah, That's everything. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So, tell me what the, what's a book going to be about? Um, my book is going to be who like um. Like before the stroke, like in the middle is going to be about like my stroke, of course. But before that, it's like uh, why I'm like that. Like why am I strong because of my grandfather, my grandfather, my grandparents, and my grandsis, our grand, uh, yeah, my grandparents, my dad, my mom, my sisters. They're all so pro- are strong. I see them as my idols, especially my dad, but my mom, but. Um, like every, there's always something that I, I am, like I am who I am because of them. Mm. And I made sure that I would re recover because of them. Like, um, so that they will not be worried or <laughs> be, yeah, depressed for themselves. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I want for my and then also the book, it will also be about um, keto, intermittent fasting, and how I recovered, because that's what that helped. Because, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot to mention, with, I had a speech therapist, uh, my speech therapist, um, he had me test, tested, um, like how, how the therapy, or how the aphasia was so I had a so my score was 77 percent it was a fail but then eight months later um I hit 97.5 percent that was so that's 97 percent and that's pass and uh, I no longer had aphasia uh that was like eight months after eight months after the the stroke but then 
uh, I think the best thing that helped that was the the diet, uh, keto and intermittent fasting. Wow. So yeah, <laughs> that's amazing, Carla. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing your amazing. You're story. very welcome. I really thank appreciate you. It. Thank you. And good luck with your book and everything that it is that you're going to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.